play and call it work. Hey there guys, Quirk here from MiniWarGaming.com and I'm back from the Renegade Open 2017. Went all the way to Minnesota, very long drive, and got to actually participate in a very large tournament at the Renegade Open, the Warhammer 40k GT. And I'm back to give you guys a breakdown on the actual, well, the premiere for it. The uh, player packet is right here. Gonna go over the actual mission types that they had, the rules they had for list construction and everything like that. Should give you guys an example of what it was like to start off a match at the Renegade Open. And then in the vault, I'm gonna be giving a very detailed breakdown of the army that I brought, why I bought, bought it and brought it and how it did. So let's get right off to a good start here. First thing on the first page is just all about the WYSIWYG stuff, you know, modeling for advantage, things like that. That's pretty straightforward, but I'll go over it really quickly anyways. Um, essentially, if you bring a model that's not the model that GW has, or you're bringing a model that GW doesn't have available yet, such as a Earthshaker cannon, you can bring in a model that looks similar to it as long as it meets the requirements. Now this actually came up a little bit because a lot of people were running just the top halves of basilisks, so just the platform with the gun. That actually has a much smaller footprint than an actual um, Earthshaker cannon. So one of the things I noticed there, they pretty much forgave it across the board, so it was a universal thing. Everybody was allowed to do it, so not too big of an issue there, but that was a few of the things that I noticed was that a lot of people were running very limited proxies, I guess. But. Still had a lot of fun, not a big deal there. At, at the end of the day, it didn't really give them that much of, a, of an advantage or a disadvantage, so moving on from there. Uh, a lot of it was uh, just straight up, don't model for advantage, so don't give yourself a larger wingspan or a shorter wingspan for your flyer so they can turn a little bit better or have a larger uh, shooting area. Don't add things to a, a vehicle that give it crazy line of sight or make it so that it can shoot around corners, stuff like that. So. Um, one of the things I did very much enjoy at the Renegade Open is that there was a painting requirement. Um, you must have a three color minimum, which was actually quite nice. Um, and it had to be based. So painting on the surface, you couldn't just have black base. It had to look like it was snow, sand, grass, gravel, gemstones, something. There had to be something on the base. So the models were all painted and all based, which was actually very, very nice there. And then on top of that, they actually threw in a player conduct rule, which was very, very nice. Uh, essentially, if at any point in time you have a problem with a player, if it happens more than twice, then it will be uh, potentially up for review, and they have a zero tolerance rule on that. So, anyway, that's it for the first couple pages there. Let's move on to the army construction. So, armies will consist of 2,000 points or less. Armies will be battle forged and can include the following options. Three detachments of any kind are allowed. There is a zero to one uh, supreme command detachment limit, which was nice there. Um, no single model, uh, no single model unit of a power level greater than 31 is allowed, so no giant Forge World models. Um, and then along with that, uh, Forge World units will be allowed, however, they are restricted to a zero per one per unit. Now, I actually went ahead and emailed the uh, tournament organizer there to get a clarification on that. Essentially what that means is if you are bringing a Forge World unit, you are only allowed one of that unit and your entire army. So if you wanted to bring, say, a Malefic Lord, you're allowed one Malefic Lord. Doesn't matter if you have multiple detachments, different things like that, you're allowed one Malefic Lord. However, <coughs> if you were to bring, say, a uh, Earthshaker platform, they do come in units of three, so you can bring three in one unit. So that would meet their one unit uh, minimum, which I will talk about later on in the Vault video about my army because I kind of did that. <coughs> um... You must have the most current version of the rules for your army and have the book present with you, no exceptions. Uh, there was a lot of people there that didn't have their, their books handy or readily available or anything like that. I know I didn't carry my books around with me because I had four books for my army. It didn't really seem to be a problem. At no point was there any real major rules, errors, or discussions. If it ever came up though, there was plenty of rule books for every single faction around. It was very easy to get a hold of one. So that was one of those rules that was kind of like, y you should, but if you don't, it shouldn't come into any issue there. Uh, the game length is a set six battle rounds, and there's no roll for additional turns, so you don't actually roll off for round five to six, it just automatically happens. The rounds, if the time if the time for your round was up, it didn't matter if you were in turn three, turn four, turn five, turn two, it was diced down and you start counting points at that time in the battle. So there are a couple, actually quite a few games, I talked to the TOs about it, where the battles ended around turn three because of time. 
and there wasn't enough time to go on to a, a fourth battle round. So a little bit of a restriction there. Still not too, too bad. All right, now we get into the fun stuff. We have the missions. So when you go to the Renegade Open, they are giving you four tokens. Now each of these tokens represents one of the four missions that we have here. There is objectives, no mercy, assassination, and a running tally via table quarters. So this is one that I'm gonna have to explain a little bit because it, it had to get explained to me differently than how it's written down here. Um, the way this works is out of those four tokens that you get, you'll be playing three games. This is the one, these, these three games will place you into a bracket and then you play three games once you're in your bracket. So once you get your four tokens, you go to your first table and you decide, okay, I'm going up against a fill in the blank army, whether it's Eldar, Chaos, whatever, you get the gist. You then get to decide which one of these tokens, whether it's objectives, no mercy, assassination, or table quarters, you want to play. Now, this is the mission that you are playing, not your opponent, just you. Then so, for example, if you want to play assassination because you can see a number of assassination targets that are fairly simple to get, you will take that token, place it face down on the board, and your opponent will do the same with whatever mission they decide. At which point you flip them over, you've come to a conclusion of which ones like everybody's playing. If you get different ones, that's okay. You're basically playing both games. Um, the other side note there is that once that token's been flipped over, it is spent, which means after that game, you're not allowed to use assassination again. You're not allowed to use whichever mission you picked, whether it's objectives, no mercy, whatever. You are not allowed to do that mission again for the next two rounds. After you've been placed in a bracket, you get your tokens back and you get to do it again. So you have to be a little bit strategic with things like that. In the event that you, for example, pick assassination and your opponent picks, let's say, no mercy, you're playing both games, which means your mission is to try and kill your four assassination targets, which I'll explain these in a minute. At the same time, you're also trying to kill more than your opponent, because if your opponent kills more than you, they'll scare, score their primary. Now, if both players score both their primaries, you split the points. So a victory on primary is worth eight points. If you get a tie, you both get four. So if you're both playing assassination, you both get assassination, you both get four points. Um, actually, no, that's wrong. I'm, I'm long there. <clears throat> If at any point in time you both flip the same thing, whether it's uh, like whatever assassination, stuff like that, if you both get it and it is a draw, neither of you score points. Forgot about that. So yeah, you got to keep that in mind. Nobody will score points if both missions are the exact same and you both, both score them because it's considered a draw, no points. <clears throat> so let's go over these really, really quickly here. Um, primary mission objectives, there are six objectives all over the board. Whoever's controlling the most at the end of the game wins that one. If both players choose this mission and a tie, no one earns the points. Makes sense. Uh, number two, no mercy. It's just kill as much as you possibly can. Keep track of the units that were killed. If you kill more than your opponent, you win this run. In the event of a tie, both all the points are lost and no one scores the mission. Assassination. Write down on your mission sheet before deployment four enemy units that are marked for assassination. You must write these down on your score sheet. Mark off what you've destroyed and complete destruction. Uh, the complete destruction of these units becomes your primary mission. Reveal uh, your choices to your opponent before seize the initiative. So you don't have to tell your opponent during deployment what your assassination targets are. It's once they've been down, once the deployment's on, you say, okay, just so you know, this, 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 and this are my targets. Uh, in the event that both players kill all four of their assassination targets because they both pick the same thing, no points are scored. And the last one that we have here, this one's a little bit tricky, is running tally table quarters. Divide the table into four parts that are 24 wide by 36 long. And these are considered the table quarters. The majority of the models in a unit are completely within the table section. Uh, a single model that is wholly within the table quarter counts as in. Um, <clears throat> so that's just for if you have a certain amount of models in the zone, you score it. So. Players control a quarter by having more models than their opponent inside a quarter. The objective is running tally scored at the end of each turn for the active player beginning on battle round two. Players earn one point for each table quarter they control at the end of their own turn. You must have the highest score at the end of the game to win. Ties are considered a loss, and if you both players choose this mission, it, no one scores the points. So that one's a little bit trickier. That one's one you want to kind of either play against a uh, melee-based army or something that you're very fast and able to get to both table quarters at the same time. It also helps if you're playing a large uh, army that is very melee based. So you're looking at orcs, Tyrion, stuff like that. That's one where you can actually get into their table's quarter, outnumber them in their quarter while still being in yours, and start going, scoring two points at a time uh, on your turn, which gives you a bit of an advantage there. So that is the primary mission. By winning that, you'll get eight points towards your total score in the tournament. Uh, ties, if you're playing two different missions, are four points, and if you're playing the same mission, no points. Moving on from the primary missions, we get to the secondary missions. Now, these ones were the bane of my existence. So, 
The way this works is that there is a list of 12 different, well technically 10, uh, different secondary objectives that you can pick. Now, in the Nova Open, the way this worked was you picked three of them, and those became your secondaries that you had to score at the end, and they were worth, I believe it was two points per. Uh, this one is, out of the five battle rounds you play, you have to pick two each battle round. So, you have things like control objective, uh, either of the objective ones, either of the objective twos, either of the objective threes, have more units outside your deployment zone than your opponent does of theirs, completely destroy a enemy unit, there's three of those, uh, control more maelstrom objective markers than your opponent, have at least three of your own units wholly within your deployment zone and no enemy units, have at least one unit wholly within your opponent's deployment zone, and then there's other ones where you can kind of sacrifice a bunch of them to get even more points. So, seems a little bit straightforward. It's, a lot of these seem like, okay, you know what, I can score, I can control objective one at the end of my turn, that's not a big deal. Here's the kicker. You don't score them at the end of your turn, you score them at the start of your next turn. So it's not a, okay, at the end of my turn, I'm controlling objective one, I got it. It's, okay, end of my turn, I'm on objective one, will this stay here until the start of my next turn? So that kind of comes in pretty, pretty big right there. The other kicker to this is that whenever you pick one of these objectives, it's gone. If you, whether you score it or not, it is gone after that turn passes. So turn one, if you decide, you know what, I want to get control objective one and completely destroy one enemy unit. If you get objective one, but you don't kill an enemy unit, you've lost that objective. That is no longer an objective that you can pick for further turns, and that's points that you've lost out on in your secondaries. So, um, <clears throat> this is another one that's worth eight points, so if you have more of these scored than your opponent at the end of the game, you score yourself eight points. In the event of a tie, you both get four, and if your opponent beats you, well, then you don't get anything. <clears throat> There's also two of them on here called Push Them Back and Slay Them All. So push them back, choose two of your, your either control objective markers, sacrifice them and attempt to gain one push them back. Control any four of the markers and gain three points. This consumes both of your choices this round. So what you can do is say, instead of going for secure objective one, secure objective two, I'm going to sacrifice both of them and I have to hold four objectives for my turn and my opponent's turn. In the event that I do that, I score four points, or sorry, I score three points. Doesn't seem like very much, but that one point difference could be the difference between whether or not you win your secondaries. So that's kind of huge. Just one like that, and there's also a slay them all where it's choose two of your completely destroy one enemy units. You have to completely destroy four units and you'll score three points. So that's kind of cool right there. Finally, we go on to the tertiary objectives. Now this is one that threw me off for the longest time, and it's actually something that I messed up when I was building my army, which I'll cover a little bit in the vault video there for you guys. The tertiaries, what I was used to was the Nova Open, where it was between turn two and turn five, you have to kill one unit every turn, and you'll score a point. This one's a little bit different. They have Slay the Warlord and Line Breaker, which are pretty straightforward, kill your enemy the warlord and end the game in your opponent's deployment zone. They also have a new one called Solo Blood. Now this is taking the position of First Blood, and I actually like the way this works. Both players may earn this objective. To score this, you must kill at least uh, one enemy unit similar, whoa, 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 I just read that way too fast. Um, so, to score this, you must kill at least a whole enemy unit similar to scoring a kill without giving up one kill in the same game turn. So, word a little bit funny, let me kind of simplify and over explain that a bit. Uh, essentially, you have to kill something, an entire unit of your opponents in one round, and then in their turn, they can't kill anything. So, if for example, you're going first and you get a kill, you essentially you got that kill, now you're open for solo blood, you have to make sure nothing on your turn dies, and, or sorry, nothing on your opponent's turn dies, and if in that entire battle round you're the only player to score a kill, you get solo blood. Thing is, it's also open for your opponent to get that as well, and second player has a pretty good chance of getting this as well, because if at any point in time during your turn you don't kill anything, it means your opponent can get that solo blood. So it's one of those ones where, you know, I could bunker down, I could just not kill anything and kind of hide, but that will leave my opponent open for a solo blood. So, got to watch out for those. But, each one of those are worth one point. So, at the end of all of this, you've got your primary missions worth eight points. You've got your um, secondary missions worth eight points. That's 16. You've got your Line Breaker for 17, Slay the Warlord for 18, and Solo Blood for 19. Perfect game is 19 points. One other thing that I forgot to mention is that if at any point in time you table your opponent, it is a perfect game, and that is a full 19 points. So, a lot of players at this event were actually going for the full tabling to try and get the perfect score. And I didn't. I I was still on the mindset of tertiaries when I built my list, so I did not build it intending to do the uh, the solo bloods there. So anyway, now we go on to the pregame setup. I'm going to go ahead and grab somebody so that we can actually show you how the pregame setup works, and that way you can have a first hand example of what it was like starting off a round at the Renegade Open. 
Okay, so I grabbed Josh, and he's gonna help me out with this. Look at that gorgeous beard. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right, so you, I kind of explained a little bit of the, the Renegade Open scenarios and stuff like that to you, so yep. you have a bit of an understanding of it. We're not going to play out a game, we're just going to go ahead and do the pregame setup so that you can see what's involved here. I've got the sheet that every player got, and it starts off pretty straight off with both players exchange a list and they go over them together. So, I, I would have handed you my list. You would Here's have got, my list. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, you brought some, some pretty cheesy stuff. Look at this, ad mech everywhere. All right. They aren't even cheesy. The player. Shush. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so then, what we would do is we would discuss the terrain effects. So these are the pieces of terrain that I've just kind of grabbed. So we can give you an example here. Um, and essentially, you and your point would go over it. So I would say, okay, where are we going to claim these as hills? Sure. Yeah. All right. Makes sense. Uh, ruins. Ruins. Yep. Line of sight blocking. Yes. All right. Now on top, are we going to say that you're allowed to go on top or no? Um. I think we'll, we'll we'll do the ruin. We'll we'll do the rules for the ruins for going on top. Okay. Of no vehicles, but let's say infantry can. And anything with a fly keyword. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. So once that's done, we've essentially agreed on what all the pieces of terrain are worth and valued at, and so on and so forth. Then we both grab a die. So if you want to grab one, I've got one over here. And we roll off to see who gets to place the first piece of terrain. I got a one. Big surprise. You got it too. All right. So you get to pick any piece of terrain you want and place it anywhere you want on the board. Okay. Well, I'm playing ad mech and I shoot, so I'm going to take this and not put it in the middle of the board. All right. Now, this is where the rules come in. We are following the same rules of terrain deployment for match play, which means you can't have within six inches of the edge of a board or within six inches of another piece of terrain. So you're going to place that one right there. Well, I'm playing a long range shooty demon army, so I want some cover. I'm going to take this and stick it right here six inches away from everything. So that's going to go right there. Okay. Which means you then get to pick another piece. Well, it's going to be terrible to take this, throw it right in the middle. Okay. Well, I kind of want some line of sight cover, possibly put something on an objective. So I'm going to take this piece, move this out of the way, stick it right there. So I'll put that right there. Boop. Okay. And you know what? I'll take that last piece here. And we'll put it right there. There we go. Because I'm pretty sure I'm going to take this side. So, once all the pieces of terrain are down, they are six inches away from a table edge and, oh, I'm sorry, five inches away from another table edge. But the thing is, if at any point in time a piece of terrain cannot be placed, it get no, six inches from a table edge, five inches from each other. Thank you. Uh, if a piece of terrain can't be placed, what happens is the piece goes down in the most logical area and all the other pieces of terrain get bumped until the requirements are met. So, something like this would happen. That's clearly not within five, so this will get bumped. No, that's not within six, so it gets bumped, and then this would get bumped. And that's how that would work. So, once that's all said and done, each player picks their primary mission. So, you have the five tokens that I gave you, and I've got my five tokens. So what this happened here is that we secretly go to the side and say, okay, well, what's Josh is playing Admech, so that means he's not going to be moving very much. He's probably going to be foot slogging it towards me. He's pretty tough to kill, so I'm not going to go for that. I'm not going to go for that. Uh, you know what? I think, I think, hmm, he's going to be able to sit on those pretty well. So I'm going to go with this one here. So I've secretly picked my objective, and Josh has secretly picked his. And then what we do is we take them, we stick them both face down in the center of the board, and reveal. So I picked table quarters, and you went with no mercy. So... Again, this is one of those scenarios where each of us are playing our own mission, but at the same time, we're playing against each other. So your job is to try and stay in your table quarters to counter the points that I'm scoring so that I don't score my objective. Mine is to try and kill more than you have. So if you're playing ad mech, it's probably going to be a little bit tricky for me because I'm playing my demon army. So now that both of these have been decided, we post the pregame abilities of our warlord traits, psychic powers, any codex-specific things, which we don't really have any because we don't have our list radio. Then what happens is we roll off again. So, uh, yeah, so we roll off again. Here's your die. I was just trying to. Go. Ha! Three and a two. All right, so if you could pass me three of the. Oh, no, I have mine over here. Ha ha! So this is where we get to place the objectives. So I've got a one, a two, and a three. Thing is, I'm not allowed to know where I'm placing what, so each of these get flipped upside down and shuffled around a little bit. Doody, doody, do. Viewers at home probably already still know what's what, but I've kind of lost track. Anyway. So I've got my three objectives. I'm going to place my first one right here. So that's going to go right there. 
Josh is going to put one right there. I'm going to put one on the hill. Even though hills don't give cover, it might come in handy. Put another one on that hill, and I'm going to stick this last one right here in the ruins. And Josh is going to place his right there. All right. So all the objectives are down. Then what we do is we flip them over so we can figure out what's what. So three, one, and two, and you got one, two, and three right there. Okay. All right, once that's all said and done, the person who placed the last objective marker gets to pick which deployment map we're doing. So in each of these missions, depending on which one you're doing, so we'll start with number one. Uh, since Josh, you placed the last one, Yep. You get to pick whether we're doing Vanguard or Search and Destroy. I think, you know what, we're going to take the Search and Destroy. All right. So since you picked the map, I get to pick the deployment zone. So I'm going to pick this one right here to keep you out of that line of sight blocking terrain. Mm -hmm. So I get this one. You get that one. And that's pretty much it. Once we've got all that said and done, we start deploying our models. And the first person to finish deploying gets a plus one bonus to a roll up to see who gets to go first. And the person who's going second does get the opportunity to try and seize the initiative. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. All those steps are done. Once we've deployed, figure out who's going first, we start our game. So what do you think? Uh, it's a cool setup. It, it, it works for me. It, it, it's interesting that it um, you get a little bit more say in the kind of mission you're doing, so it helps with the army building a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, I did mention to you before that once you've spent your No Mercy token, You've lost it for the yep. the tournament. Yep. So you do not get that back. So you would basically waste your no mercy on me, and I'd be wasting. You waste. I'm I'm burning my table quarters on you, sir. I'm going to go <laughs> for a table in here and a full score. So, anyway, so that's pretty much how the whole renegade table setup goes. That's it for the actual premiere package. Every single mission came with its own little. I'm making a mess here. Uh, every single mission that we had had its own two different deployment maps that were decided. So it was things like Vanguard, Search and Destroy. Then there was Frontline Assault and. Uh, Hammer and Anvil, and then there was Spearhead and Dawn of War. Uh, each mission you got to pick your two secondaries through the five turns. Tablings are a full win, and that's pretty much it. So, I've kind of sort of explained it to you. I went through crazy detail on this one. What do you think of the whole Renegade package? It's definitely an interesting concept, and it's one where it gives me a little bit of a pause, because I've always said that I'm not really a tournament player. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to go to tournaments way back when, but local small tournaments, and they weren't my jam. But it's got me kind of rethinking, uh, you know, if I want to maybe change that idea. Yeah. All right, guys. So there you go. That's going to be it for the breakdown of the Renegade Open Premier Player Packet. And if you're a Vault member, go ahead and click that link below. I'm going to go over the army list that I brought in detail, how it worked, how it did, and kind of a little bit of a backstory on what happened with that, because there's... It was a nice little adventure that went along with me trying to build my army. I can only imagine. <sighs> anyway guys, so go ahead and click that link below. We'll see you guys in the vault. Thanks so much for watching, and happy wargaming.